second reading this morning is also from the first letter of John. Chapter 3, verses 13 through 18. And that's found on page 1103 of the Church Bible. Not be surprised, brethren, if the world hates you. <coughs> we know that we have passed out of death into life. Because we love the brethren. He who does not abide in he who does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has the world's good and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? Little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed. This is the word of our Lord. <coughs> Let's have a word of prayer. Uh, Heavenly Father, uh, use this time to speak through our hearts and give us a uh, insight, wisdom, understanding, with what you've laid upon my heart this hour this day. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, folks, um, I want to look at uh, 1 John chapter 3, verses 13 through 18. But before I actually get there, uh, years ago, I came across an evangelist, a Christian evangelist and speaker, and they, they did a series on the Ten Commandments. And um, they, it was very, very, got my attention. It was a very, very unusual approach. The speaker actually flipped the order of the commandments. Instead of starting with number one, he started with number ten. A very, very unusual approach. And it got my, my attention. Uh, creative, and yet I thought it was kind of odd. And I'll tell you why I thought it was odd. Because when you go into Exodus 19, how does God have it? Number one. He doesn't start with number 10. He starts with number one. Okay? And my point is, is that God never gave us the order in which this evangelist laid it out. Now, I know he was trying to be creative, but, you know, not the way I generally think. Now, why is it that God gave us the order of the Ten Commandments in that particular order? Because it's in terms of priority. The first four, as you know, are God-oriented, and then the following six are brother and sister-oriented. And remember when the Pharisees asked Jesus what was the greatest commandment? He said, love the Lord your God. He talked about loving God first, and then loving your neighbor. So uh, I think what's implied in this order is exactly this. We can't start here. We have to start there. We have to start with God. Uh, we always have to start with God. If we don't start with God, we will always lose our way. So this morning, I want to speak to you about loving God and loving your brother and sister in Christ. We're going to look at uh, 1 John but if you notice the corresponding passage that Dave read, 1 John 5, he talks about the same thing. He talks about loving brothers and sisters in Christ. And the only way that you can do that is to love God and keep his commandments. Now, uh, let me set this passage and the epistle in its context because uh, it's really important to do that so we can understand the historical context in which John is writing. So if you go through the epistle, 
John is addressing various false teachings or heresies in the church. We would say that they're aberrant teachings or opinions that actually go contrary to Scripture. So for our purposes, we're going to refer to them as uh, false teachings. The other thing I want to say, too, and this is really, really important, but when we come to Scripture and we talk about God, and we were mentioning this in Sunday school this morning, there is absolutely no way that we all see it all, and we all understand it all. But we do know that Scripture interprets Scripture. And so at a certain point, we can start to gather uh, um, or systematize various beliefs that uh, what the Bible teaches, like about angels and about salvation and about end times things and about the person of God, uh, etc. <clears throat> So scripture interprets scripture. And what we have here now is a certain set of creeds or teachings that have emerged as Christian based on the Holy Bible. When I use the, the, the sense of creeds now, I'm not necessarily talking about church history creeds, like the Apostle Creed. But if you take a look at the Apostles' Creed, it has a certain body of truth or beliefs that come out of Holy Scripture. And so what I'm talking about, when I use the word creed here, I'm not so much thinking about church history creeds so much as I am beliefs that come out of the Bible. And so these creeds, these beliefs, have been based off of Scripture for the last 2,000 years. Now, the reality is, is this, is that when people don't agree on a set of teachings and beliefs, they often separate. And when you're talking about a church family, they split churches. There's separation, and people leave. The Apostle John is dealing with this kind of situation, although not in a local church. He's talking about how people leave the Christian community because they no longer believe anymore. Uh, it reminds me of, uh, I love the movie, The, the Recruit. I think it was The Recruit, right, Drew? Is it uh, Al Pacino, and uh, he's, a, he's, a, he's a defective CIA agent, and um, he's found out, and there's a line in his, where he says, and Hol Holy Father, I don't believe anymore. In other words, he was basically saying that he didn't believe in his cause as a CIA agent. He, he went rogue. He didn't, you know, he kind of left the reservation. Now, our purpose is here, we're talking about leaving the faith. Uh, take a look at 1 John 2, verse 19, because John touches on this. Uh, he goes on to say, They went out from us, but they were not really of us, for if they had been of us, they would have remained with us. But they went out in order that it might be shown that they are not of us. Now, uh, so the split where people were leaving was definitely... Uh, truth versus error. Now, very quickly, if you analyze John's epistle, you know, he talks about how Jesus Christ came in the flesh. Now, why did John say that? Be because you and I don't have a problem with that, but there are some people today that are searching for the historical Jesus, and they don't believe that Jesus came in the flesh. Well, if you go back 2,000 years ago, John was writing against a heresy called docetism. And the belief was that God is spirit and God came upon a particular person and then that person was crucified and the spirit left that person at Calvary. But God didn't really come in the flesh. You see, so when, when John says anyone who believes that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God, that's why he writes these things, you see. Uh, we were talking in Sunday school today and they're going back and forth with a pastor friend of mine. But, you know, Christ is fully God, and he's fully human. And we don't understand how God does that, but he did it. And so John is dealing with this heresy, and, and he's also dealing with other themes that you're going to notice. Uh, for example, themes of light, 1 John, themes of life, and themes of love. And, and these are things that John actually incorporates in his gospel as well. So 1 John is about Christian fellowship. 
It's fellowship with God, and it's fellowship with brothers and sisters in Christ. And if you go over to verse chapter 2 of 1 John, and we'll look at this verse a little bit later, well, we can look at, verse, look at verse, right now, verse 15, he says, do not love the world. So it's, it's fellowshipping with God, fellowshipping with other brothers and sisters in Christ, and not fellowshipping with the world. And so that's the context. Now, I have some other things I just want to kind of quickly share uh, and get out of the way before I get to the text here. It's, it's, uh, I want to share some things uh, conceptually and philosophically. I think that's important because it relates to our culture today. But, you know, it's kind of like taking a picture and putting it in a frame. And when you do that, you get contrast, don't you? You frame it out. Today, there's a big thing, you know, where people take pictures and they don't use frames. I want to put it in a frame here. So it, it, it's worth noting in our culture that there's been seismic shifts from creeds to deeds. In other words, what they're saying is that what you believe anymore, uh, what you believe doesn't matter anymore. That's what they're saying. And it's actually all about doing. It's not about doctrine or beliefs. Uh, Creeds to deeds was actually a phrase uh, coined by Dr. Michael Kruger, Christian man, president of a seminary reform movement. Um, they believe that the Bible is the word of God. Uh, and we wouldn't agree with everything, but good man. All right? And he wrote uh, an article in a book uh, about the Christian left movement. We talked about the Christ left, Christian left movement a couple of years ago. Um, Jane sent me some emails back and forth about it. But the, the Christian left movement doesn't believe what you and I believe. Uh, it's the liberal <coughs> ecumenical branch of the visible church. And I underline visible because if you have the Holy Spirit of God in your heart, you are of the church. Just because you physically go to church doesn't mean you have the Spirit of God dwelling in your heart. So I emphasize the visible church, the visible liberal ecumenical church. And, and what they've done is they've totally rewritten the Ten Commandments. That's where I'm going with this. Uh, let me share them with you very quickly and see if you don't pick some things up here. All right? uh, because you're going to see that beliefs do matter. Uh, they, number one, this is their number one thing. Jesus is a model uh, for living more than an object of worship. What they're saying is, we don't worship him. Number two, they affirm people's potential more than reminding them that they are sinful and broken. Uh, number three, the work of reconciliation should be valued over making judgments. You know, um, so it's not about addressing any sinful behaviors. Number four, gracious behavior is more, more important than right belief. That's a problem. Gracious behavior is important, but right belief is very important as well. Number five, inviting questions more than that is more valuable than supplying answers. Uh, number six, encouraging the personal search is more important than group uniformity. Uh, hey, I tell you to search the scriptures all the time, don't I? I encourage you to personally and spiritually search. Number seven, meeting actual needs is more important than maintaining institutions. Number eight, peacemaking is more important than power. Number nine, people should care more about love, less about sex. There you go. If you're, a, you're born as a guy, you can become a girl. And if you're born as a girl, you want to become, you can, you know, or like you, whatever, whatever, you say, whatever you want to become. And then number 10, life in this world is more important than the afterlife. And then in parentheses, they have that eternity is God's work anyway. Okay? So those are the Ten Commandments and of the liberal left. And they're actually promoted <coughs> by a Franciscan priest. Anyway, Dr. Kruger writes, listen to this. Not, quote, not long ago I came across a list of ten principles set forth by proponents of progressive Christianity. They, they are, in effect, a new... Ten Commandments. What's striking is that they are far less about God revealing his desires 
and far more about man expressing his own. Less Moses, more Oprah. <laughs> Yet, each of these commandments is partially true. Indeed, that is, that is what makes the list in progressive Christianity as a whole so challenging. Half-truths can sound quite appealing until you recognize their foundations and implications. In this guy, I di he goes on to write, I diagnose and critique each of these tenets and offer a brief biblical and theological response. The book's called The Ten Commandments of Progressive Christianity by Dr. Michael J. Kruger. And, and here's my point in mentioning all of this. You cannot have deeds without creeds. You simply cannot hold to creeds without deeds. They both go hand in hand. You can't isolate and simply say, I believe. And you can't simply say, I don't believe this. I don't believe anything. I'm just going to simply do. Now, why is that? Because what we believe is philosophically, and it determines who and what we are. Right thinking? Right thinking. Deeds determine the proper, practical approach. It determines why we do what we do. I was reflecting on this. I'm thinking, you know, think about this. Deeds and creeds actually follow the logical argument that James puts forth in Scripture when he talks about faith and works. How do you have faith and yet no works? And how do you have works as a basis for your salvation? You can't, you see. So clearly, you need faith and works, and you need deeds and creeds. The other thing that I, I want to say, too, is we've seen new gospels promoted in our culture today. We have a secular gospel of grace, love, and kindness. We've talked about that. And it's a humanistic love. And if you analyze it, it's based on half-truths. And it truly leaves God out. And therein lies the problem. And then we see another gospel of the progressive Christian left under the banner of Christianity. And it's liberal secularism, and they too have left God out. Half-truths leaving the other half of the scriptural teaching out. Now, we've also seen half-truths when it comes to preaching the gospel. How many times have you heard the gospel where people say, all you have to do is believe? Uh, Peter didn't say that. Peter said, repent and believe, you see. So there has to be a decision of recognizing and asking Christ to be your Lord and Savior and a change of mind and heart. But it, it, today it's simple believers. And so we leave the repent part out in our culture. So, so what do what do these new gospels kind of look like? You, you, ever, you ever open up a, a nut? It's like, hey, I got a chip, I only got half a nut in here. Do you ever have that happen? It's like only half of the nut developed, right? And, and what you have, when you have a half a nut, you have a whole lot of nuttiness. Now that doesn't make sense, right? But what I'm trying to say here is that these new gospels are totally devoid of the whole of the teaching of Scripture. It's half the equation. And John says that that is spiritually deceptive. He talks about spiritual deception in verse 7 of chapter 3. Uh, let me see if I can quickly uh, find and read that. Little children, let no one deceive you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous. Just as he is righteous. Verse 8, the one who practices sin is of the devil. The spiritual deception. You know, presenting a half truth. And, you know, you think of half truths, what you think of Abraham, right? Spiritually deceptive, but she's she's my sister. And so what we what we have here is, and get this, it's the spiritual deception to strip, to isolate character and yet strip God out of it. They seek to take character and separate it from the life and character. And it's a humanistic character. You hear all these most common values as opposed to traditional values, you say. And so 
so they promote a human love and a tolerance and acceptance of, of anything goes, regardless of what scripture says. And yet it's actually more than that, because if you don't embrace what they promote, then you're canceled, you're cast out, or you're ostracized. That's what it is. We see this in various levels beyond the church. We see it, you know, if you don't get vaxxed, you don't you, you lose your job, et cetera, et cetera. But it, it's cancel culture. That's what it is. And, and here's my point. There is a love that is being promoted apart from the love of God and the love of Christian brothers. And John warned against that. If you go back to John chapter 2, 1 John 2, verse 15, he says, do not love the world. Now, John's obviously not referring to people because the scripture says, for God so loved the world, right? God loves people, we're to love people. But John is referring to a system of principles and beliefs that would actually take us away from fellowship with Christ. And, 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 and it's a worldly system that embraces a spirit of antichrist. And you know that that spirit of antichrist opposes God and everything that God stands for. And everything that has been revealed in Holy Scripture. Now, what is the system besides it being antichrist? It, it's a system of moral relativism. And it's a system that has no moral absolutes. So, for example, we'll say, well, you can't know that this is true and absolute. Yes, I can. Because the Spirit of God tells me. You say, I know it. Everything front to back in this cover is perfectly true. True, true, true. Forever and all eternity. But they say, no, it's not. And, and how do you know that this whole thing isn't a dream? I mean... They talk about that stuff in philosophy books. So we have a system of moral relativism, no absolutes. It's about deeds, not creeds, and it's lawless in anything goes. And that's the movement that we see today that we're living on. It's not about loving God, and it's not loving about loving Christian people. But John is talking about that. This is what John is saying. Loving God. You can't love. You can't love your brother and sister in Christ unless you love God. Take a look at verses 13 through 15 here. There's two groups that John refers to. It's the group that has separated from and has left the believing community. And then the other group is the believing community. And if you take a look at it, these two groups are worlds apart. One has passed from death to life. That is, one, one group is saved. One group has eternal life. One group has Jesus. Uh, this group loves God, and they love their fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. The other group hates. They do not love God. They, they do not love true believers. They do not have Jesus. They are unsaved. They are spiritually dead. They have been unregenerated. They don't have the Spirit of God in their life and heart. That's two groups. And, and they can't coexist. Now, the other thing here, too, is you know that John is writing to the believing community. And he's not referring to a generic love, a humanistic love. A secular love. He's talking about loving God, his commandments and his teachings, and it's about loving those who love God in this way. Uh, it, the example that John actually gives of hate, we didn't, we didn't read this here, but if you go back to verse 11, um, just before verse 13, he says, uh, for this is the message you've heard from me, that we should love one another. First of all, not as Cain, who was of the evil one, and slew his brother. For this reason, why did he slay him? Because his deeds were evil and his brothers were 
right? It's, it's the age, age old story of Cain and Abel. Cain hated what Abel stood for. He hated Abel's righteousness and the fact that he loved God and he was committed. And that hate led to anger, and that led, that anger led to murder. Or the anger led to hate, and the hate led to murder. And and Jesus spoke of that timeless principle. Uh, what's in the heart comes out of the heart, right? It was true for Cain. This is true for those who are of the world. They hate God. They hate his commandments. They hate his teaching. They hate his word. And they hate you and me because we stand on his word and the testimony of Jesus. Do not marvel, verse 13, brethren, if the world hates you. I was thinking about this. Uh, this should be very, very easily discernible. I should be able to easily identify those who hate me. You should be able to easily identify those who hate you. Do people receive us or reject us based on our Christian beliefs and who and what we stand for? If, you're, if, if they hate you for that, then you know what side of the aisle they're on, right? It should be pretty easily identifiable. Uh, take a look at verse uh, 16 here. Uh, John gives love's greatest example. That Lord Jesus Christ laying down his life as a sacrifice. That's foundational to loving God and loving others. He loved God the Father to the point of, I'll go. I'll voluntarily lay my life down. He lays God lays his life down for the cause of God. That was his mission. And that's so important. Why? When you take a look at the text here, John's not talking about the haters. They're done. He's not talking to the haters. He's talking to the Christian community. And, 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 and he's reminding believers of what love should look like. And loving God also means loving their brother and sister in Christ. And, and if you take a look at uh, what John is saying here in verse 17, uh, let me read verse 17 for you. But whoever has the world's goods and beholds his brother in need and closes up his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? John's concerned about creeds and deeds. He's not dismissive of either one. Now, Jesus literally laid his life down. We may be called to do that. We may not be called to do that. I don't know. Maybe that's what. Maybe that's the, the end of my life. That's how I die. Maybe that's how you die. But you notice here that John incorporates other things that are actually loving. You don't have to lay your life down, but you have to be sensitive to what's going on around you in terms of. Do people have other needs? And at the very least, the loving thing does mean caring and sharing and giving in the community of the church. And, you know, John's talking about material needs here. Um, and let me just comment real quickly on the material needs. Uh, this, is, this is not just throwing money and goods and services and things that brothers and sisters in Christ who are in need. I think it's fair to say that John is referring to genuine needs. And I think the situation presupposes that something unexpected has come up or a difficult circumstance has come up where a person has a need and you help them. Losing one's job, an unforeseen health expense, the need for clothing, food, or shelter. I don't think that this is something where uh, John is saying you just throw money and stuff at situations and people all day long. It, it, it has parameters. Love has parameters, and giving has parameters. This is not a socialistic model that John is putting forward where you give everything away and you live in community and you have kumbaya. It's not. Love 
test parameters and giving test parameters. And, and what I'm saying is this, is John is not enabling and promoting a sinful, irresponsible, welfare type of lifestyle that we see our government promoting today and other people who would love to promote that kind of stuff. That's not what John is saying. In, in fact, uh, the Apostle Paul said, if a man doesn't work, he doesn't eat. You see? So, so we're talking about genuine needs, situational needs, not necessarily ongoing, you know, cradle to the grave needs. Needs. And you know, I, I've said this before, I'll say it again. I'll give somebody a meal. I've done it. I'll give somebody 10 meals. I'll give them 20 meals. But I want them to learn to fish. Amen? Give a man, you've heard the expression, give a man a fish, he eats for a day. Teach a man to fish and wait for a lifetime. So I believe that this is genuine needs and situational to get people out of where. They're at. It's not enabling and it's not promoting a sinful lifestyle. Uh, take a look at verse 18 real quickly. Uh, Don, John, John doesn't use these words, but what he's basically saying is talk is cheap. Uh, you know, let's not just talk about it, but do something about it. Talk is actions speak louder than words. And, and John is expecting that the Christian thing to do is when you see a brother or sister in need, that you're responsive to that. So, so important. Uh, here's the other thing I want to say, and I'm, and I'm going to, um, maybe I'm reading a little bit more into the text here, but I don't think so, um, generally in terms of my worldview. But I, I believe that the caring and the sharing and the giving, the loving, is, it, is not necessarily limited to the material needs. It, I believe that it extends to the sharing and the giving and the caring and the loving in Christian community. It's being there for your brothers and sisters in Christ. That's what it is. It goes beyond the material needs. John references the material needs, but remember, he talked about the life of Christ, did he not? Giving his, giving his life. And, and so I'm just going to, it begs the question here, but you tell me how, how believers can truly love God and love their fellow brothers apart from the Christian community. I mean, I think that's a relevant question. Because we have, we have believers today that don't frequent a fellowship or a church. So you tell me how can they meet the needs of their brothers and sisters in Christ, whether it be material, spiritual, emotional, and courage, how, how, does, how does iron sharpen iron when one piece of iron is within the building and the other is apart from the building? I don't think it's possible. I'm not saying that you can't show Christian love, but I'm saying it's awfully hard to lay down your life for your brothers and sisters in Christ when you don't come to church and you don't fellowship within the Christian community within a local body of believers. And, and this is a spiritual phenomenon. I think COVID has somewhat magnified it, but it was always there under the surface. You know, it's kind of like a lone ranger Christian mentality. And, and God didn't ordain that either. And, and so what is the answer to my question? How do they show it? I don't think that they can. I don't think that they consistently can show the love of God and the love of their fellow brother and sister in Christ when they remain separate. It's just not possible. I have seen, we have a loving church family. I have seen people pour out their hearts. I have seen people cry together, pray together, laugh together, fellowship, eat together, uh, do do wonderful things together in terms of just hanging out in fellowship. And, and you gain great, great strength from that, do you not? I do. Uh, before I close, uh, I, I want to address a charge that is often leveled at Christians, uh, you and me, because we're called haters, aren't we? That's, that's what they say today. Oh, 
Christians are haters because we haven't bought into the moral relativism. Uh, because we don't embrace it, we're charged with being intolerant, unaccepting, uncaring, unloving, and the like. You've heard, you've heard it, you've probably read about it. Let me, let me answer to that by using an analogy and sharing a couple of texts with you. I used this analogy years and years and years ago. Uh, it's worth recycling. If you know that a bunch of kids are playing in a refrigerated cardboard sized box in the middle of Route 495, and a tractor trailer is barreling down the highway and is going to crush those kids in the box, what do you do? Do, do you let them play in the box? Is that the loving thing to do? Or do we encourage them, actually the kids, do we run and we, do we pull them out of the box before it gets crushed? The answer is obvious. The loving thing to do would be to act and encourage them to leave the box, drag them out. Now, here's the problem. Uh, what happens if adults are playing in the box? <laughs> you can't easily drag adults out. <laughs> we seek to persuade them. That's what we do. And so let me give you a, a scripture um, where there is one such example where Jesus persuaded and he encouraged. And he wasn't a hater, and he wasn't intolerant, and he wasn't a bigot, and he wasn't unloving and uncaring. John chapter 8, you take the woman caught in adultery. Jesus encouraged the woman caught in adultery to sin no more, right? He didn't throw the stone, and you know that he could have. He didn't say, continue in the play box or sandbox of sin. He didn't say that to her. He brought the proper balance, and what did he say? Go and sin no more. He didn't condemn her. He didn't condone her. That's the proper balance. Also, you take a look at 1 Corinthians 5. A situation in the church of incest. Paul didn't encourage a sinful, immoral situation in the church. He didn't say, continue in sin, God doesn't care. In fact, if you read the text, many would say that he was quite harsh in his approach. Actually, it probably seems that Paul had given oral instruction or through a prior letter had addressed that situation and expected it to be set right. And the way you want to understand that context is that the church, the Corinthian church, ignored it and didn't address the situation. So then only was Paul forced to take a different approach and write openly about what he expected and what he was going to do. Balance. And then Paul further writes in verse in Romans chapter six, verse one and two, are we to continue to sin that might that, that, that are we to continue to sin that grace might increase? And the answer is absolutely no. So what we see here is loving God fits in with a proper behavior and proper lifestyle. And when that when that is conducted, when that's lived properly, when a person lives properly and properly conducts themselves, that's loving the Christian community, your brother and sister in Christ. And both cases in Scripture here are caring, sharing, giving, and loving attitude that was displayed and adopted. Paul did it. Here's another hypothetical, but it's not the Route 495 scenario. It's the analogy of the pier and the life preserver. We're on a pier. We're all hanging out. Maybe you have an ice cream cone. You know, maybe you're down, I don't know, maybe you're down in Plymouth or whatever. I think there's a pier. And um, you see a brother or sister in Christ in the water drowning. <coughs> or maybe you see a person in the world of the world that's drowning. What do you do? You have a life raft. What do you do? No, this is my lifesaver. I'm going to keep it. Or do you throw it to them? 
So you throw them the lifesaver of truth, life, and love that they might live or be with hope. Take that hypothetical and translate it into a real situation. If we were seriously down there, what would you do? You would throw the lifesaver to them, right? That's the loving thing to do. We wouldn't hold it. Maybe if you're a great, maybe you just jump in and help them, right? That would be giving you life, perhaps. Why is it that we would do something differently when it comes to the spiritual realm. But we don't do that. Uh, why is it that we would do in the literal realm, but we, we back off when it comes to the spiritual realm? What do we do? I, I don't, I, I struggle to understand why we would do something literally to save, literally save a person's life. But spiritually, back off and not seek to help direct them when it comes to spiritual eternal life. Uh, it, it seems to me that God entered into history from eternity because he is dealing with an eternal matter. And, you know, if you take a look at the last ten commandment, they say eternity is left to God. So, so why is it that we withhold scripture and the gospel, life, light, love, truth, and, and yet we would actually throw a physical life saver or jacket uh, You know, that, those are things that, that we need to reconcile from the spiritual to the literal realm. Um, in closing, uh, it's creeds and demons. What you believe determines what you ultimately will do. And I think that that's John's point here. It's more than just what we believe. It, it's about acting on it. And um, that shows the love of God and the love for your fellow brother or sister in Christ. I've, done, I've thrown an awful lot out to you today. I, this is not a Bud Light type of sermon. I'm trying to challenge you to think. Um, but um, and, and hopefully the Holy Spirit of God has uh, touched our hearts to that end. Let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, um, uh, thank you for uh, the opportunity to um, show your love, uh, to, to speak it, um, and to show it in um, very practical, practical and tangible ways. Um, thank you for the love uh, that exists here in this fellowship. And um, uh, thank you that we remain in your love. Uh, give us the opportunities to uh, love in, in deed and in, in word and deed and in creed and deed and in, in truth. And uh, in a very, very tangible way. Uh, give us opportunities opportunities to uh, love our brothers and sisters in Christ here in 